The freedom of establishment and the freedom of services are often overlooked within the context of EU law, but they have been really important for the completion of the internal market. They've also been really important generally for liberalisation of markets across the European Union. And while this has meant that many people have been able to make a lot of money, it has also meant that there have been serious political and social ramifications as a result of these freedoms. We'll explore some of those ramifications towards the end of this video, but in the meantime we're best placed by starting to define establishment and services. So let's get on with doing that right now. There is one main difference between establishment and services, and that is that establishment implies permanence, whereas services implies a degree of temporariness. So if I'm setting up a company or a business, that would be freedom of establishment. But if I was providing a service to someone and then returning home to my own country, that would fall under the freedom of services. Establishment is Articles 49 to 54 of the Treaty on the Functioning of the European Union, while services falls under Articles 56 to 62. We're going to look at each of these in turn, so let's begin with Article 49 to do with the freedom of establishment. And in particular, Article 49.1 allows for both primary and secondary establishments. So if I start a brand new business, that is a primary uh, establishment. Whereas if I have already got a business but want to seek to expand that business to another uh, country with, say, a franchise, that would be a secondary establishment. And so Article 49.1 implies that both are covered uh, under this particular freedom. Article 49.2 prohibits unequal treatment, and so this is more of a focus on any discriminatory measures that would benefit um, residents of a particular member state over residents of another member state. It's also important to say in this early case of Rainers in 1974, it was held that freedom of establishment would be directly effective. In other words, an individual or a company would be able to bring a case against the state um, as you will have already seen from the cases of Van Genden Luis, which is the obviously main direct effect case. Also, equivalent qualifications in particular areas such as um, law or in this case of Halen's, it was to do a football training uh, thing. Um, and these are interpreted very broadly. So if you have a qualification to do something in your country, the chances are that it will be accepted in another country so that you can do the same thing. And this was also expanded um, in the Directive 2005-36, which had the main focus on the harmonisation of qualifications across the whole of the European Union. Article 49.2 that we talked about on the last slide as being to do with uh, discriminatory measures has actually been broadened out to go beyond that discrimination and it covers any unjustified restriction on the freedom of establishment. And the main case in this area is Gebhard from 1995 and I've included quite a long quote here but I think it's particularly useful because it summarises the four key points. So national measures which are liable to hinder or make less attractive the exercise of fundamental freedoms must fulfill four conditions. In other words, if you want to restrict the freedom of establishment, there are severe conditions that you must meet in order for that restriction to be allowed to fly by the European Court of Justice. The restriction must be uh, non-discriminatory, it must be justified, it must be focused on the attainment of a particular objective, and it must not go beyond what is actually necessary to achieve that objective. Under Article 49, a person can rely on that with respect to their own country, but only where they have exercised the freedom to move anyway. So in the case of Nors from 1979, this was about a Dutchman who had moved to Belgium. In Belgium, he had trained as a plumber, and then he had returned to um, Holland to try and um, work as a plumber in that country. He suffered as a result of um, a discriminatory measure. He brought a case under Article 49 and he was allowed to bring that case even though he was a Dutch national um, bringing a case against the Dutch authorities. 
Um, however, this does not apply to wholly internal situations. So to take the same case again, if Noors had um, trained as a plumber in Holland and then had always remained in that same country which he was born in, then he would have been unable to bring a case. In other words, Norse was only able to bring the case because he had exercised his freedom of movement by traveling to Belgium and then returning to Holland. And so this can actually lead to a slightly unusual situation where in certain circumstances, um, people can actually be discriminated against within their own country. Article 54 of freedom, uh, under the Freedom of Establishment says that companies should be treated in the same way as individuals. In other words, companies have this legal personality that we often consider to be the case under UK law. This can be a little bit difficult at times because obviously um, countries can vary greatly in terms of how their company law actually operates. And this is something that the European Court of Justice has actually contended with and has dealt with quite well really because it's focused on the overall objective of freedom of establishment and has basically tried to ignore some of the distinctions between different countries. So in this case of Centros from 1999 we have a distinction between UK company law and Danish company law. Now in the UK certainly at this time you could basically set up a company with one pound. It was very cheap to do so. However, in Denmark, it, the equivalent cost would have been thousands and thousands of pounds because of the way that Danish law operated. And Centros basically got around this by setting up a company in the UK for a pound and then carrying out all of its secondary establishments back in Denmark and so it basically got around Danish law, which was more strict and onerous than UK law. And the Court of Justice allowed this because they said, well, the focus is on the freedom of establishment. This company has clearly made a decision in relation to this and said that they're going to establish in the UK and run secondary establishments in Denmark. And just because they're avoiding certain rules doesn't make that illegal. Uber searing is a similar principle as well, where the European Court of Justice held against um, the not allowing uh, German courts to recognise a company that had not been incorporated in Germany. Clearly, that was discriminatory. And so the European Court of Justice overruled that. It is important to say that this is not a complete freedom, though. And so once a company is registered in a member state, such as the UK, then that country has the right to set the conditions for incorporation and the related rules. So this Daily Mail case in 1988, the Daily Mail, as many of you know, is a British newspaper. And in, 19, in the 1980s, they tried to move their establishment over to, I think it was Holland, um, in order to try and avoid certain taxes. And in theory, that would have been fine. But part of the British laws on establishment said that before they left, they would have to pay their tax bill to the Treasury. And they didn't want to do this. So the case went to court and they said, well, once you are established in the UK or another member state, then you do have to abide by those rules. And that means that before you leave the UK, you would have to pay your tax bill. Um, and building on this, we see from this Cadbury Schweppes case in 2006 that it means it's quite hard to crack down on tax avoidance. So if people work out a sort of tax scheme that means they can incorporate in one country and then sort of do business in another country, you see all of these sort of strange tax um, ways of avoiding tax. If they do that, then it's difficult for the European Court of Justice to crack down on this because of the freedom of establishment. And that's maybe one of the disadvantages there. So that's freedom of establishment, but let's move on now to freedom of services. We talked about freedom of services being more temporary compared to freedom of establishment, which is more focused on setting up a brand new company. Services is based on the temporary nature of the work, and that's temporary in terms of the work itself rather than the infrastructure. So, for example, uh, you may go over to a country to carry out certain work and that may take you a few months and you might need to sort of rent an office for that amount of time. 
Now, just because you've got an office for a few months doesn't mean that you are now based in that country and you have established yourself. The infrastructure, you know, your actual sort of way of working doesn't necessarily matter. Also, it doesn't have to be a short period of time. This is particularly relevant in the Commission in Portugal case because that was to do with construction work. And as many of you may know, if you are constructing, say, a huge block of flats or something, that can take several years. And so this, even though it's quite a long period of time, for the purposes of the law in this area, it is still considered temporary. Article 57 defines uh, services. It's not a, an exclusive definition, and so it just gives you an idea about what services might include. So industrial stuff, commercial stuff, and um, crafts and the professions, however you want to sort of define that. It's not particularly useful, but it does give you some idea about what services are included and what the um, treaty means by this. Meanwhile, Article 58 specifically excludes transport, banking and insurance, and that's simply because they're dealt with elsewhere in the treaty. Uh, freedom of services also has direct effect, and that comes from the famous case of Van Binsbergen in 1974. And we'll return to that case in a little bit, but it means that a, an individual can bring a case against the state in this matter. Again, there has to be an interstate element, and Deliège is to do with a Belgian woman who had a complaint against the Belgian Judo Federation, but because that was a purely internal matter, um, she was not really able to bring that case. Um, and it also includes the freedom to receive services as well as the uh, freedom to deliver services. That was from the case of Luisi and Carboni in 1984, although we'll see on the next slide there's also a case of Cowan where you can receive services as well. The service must be provided for remuneration, so again we have this problem in Deliège where we have a, a person who is a judo player, is that the right word? Probably not. Um, anyway, they're a person who does judo um, professionally, but they're not being paid for it. And so if there's no remuneration involved, if it's not really like a commercial um, service, um, then you are not able to use this particular treaty article. Um, this idea of remuneration can cause some confusion because the way that healthcare is set up across the EU means that it's unclear at times whether there has been a payment for services. Um, this was particularly seen in the case of Great Smith 2001, where there was an insurance scheme that was set up by the state. It was contributed to by the government, but the person or the individual themselves made contributions and so the court said that because this person was making contributions towards this state system they were actually um, investing in it and providing remuneration for the purposes of the freedom of services again you can sort of think about this in maybe a uk context um, the national health service you would think there is not really any remuneration you often don't pay for things but there are certain aspects of the health service where you are paying for certain items and that would raise interesting uh, questions whether this is a service for the purposes of EU law. Um, and given a broad interpretation, um, even receipt of social benefits can actually be permitted. So Cowan in that particular case from 1989 had been caught up in a terrorist attack in Paris but he was unable to receive any money from the compensation scheme because he was not a French national. He argues under the freedom of services. This seemed like a very loose, loose argument based on the idea that he hadn't really provided any remuneration. But the European Court of Justice gave a broad interpretation that said because he's a tourist, he's spending money in the country and that is enough for remuneration. Whether that case would be decided the same way today is difficult to answer. Maybe the courts are a little bit sympathetic then. Um, but it shows you that remuneration can be interpreted quite broadly. There are certain controversial services that you can think of probably across the European Union, lotteries, abortions, um, provision of marijuana in Holland, where it's sort of partially legalised. And these can still be considered as services, as per the case of Grogan in 1991. But states may regulate these in a way that is proportional and non-discriminatory. So states do have certain um, powers of restriction. And this is fair enough because it preserves the freedom of services, 
but it also preserves the freedom of nation states to make their own decisions about certain moral issues as well. Article 62 allows for further restrictions on, say, policy, security and health grounds, but most of the restrictions actually come back to the Van Binsbergen case in 1974 that we talked about earlier in relation to direct effect, and it sets out the basic conditions for any restriction on the freedom of services. So it has to pursue a legitimate public interest, has to be applied without discrimination, has to be proportionate, and as per Carpenter 2002, it also has to respect fundamental rights. Um, restrictions on tax grounds can be used to prevent fraud, but similar as when we talked about freedom of establishment, broader restrictions cannot be applied. Um, so simply seeking to broaden the tax base and therefore impose a restriction on services by doing that is not enough of a justification as per Dana 2002. And so we see again that it does open up that possibility for greater tax avoidance when people are trying to do that. Even restrictions which are non-discriminatory can be caught if they hinder the freedom of services. So this comes back again to the idea that it doesn't have to be a distinction between a national of a member state and a national of another member state, and that's where the discrimination occurs. It can be anything that hinders the freedom of services. So in Alpine Investments in 1995, the Dutch government had made a complete ban on cold calling people and this was seen as a restriction on the freedom of services and was allowed by the European Court of Justice even though it applied to Dutch nationals and non-Dutch nationals alike. Um, we can also see that the um, Gebhard case that we saw very early on in the video also applies in relation to restrictions and so you might want to go back to that and sort of pick out the uh, four things I think it was from that case. Controversial in this uh, controversial area in freedom of services is to do with posted workers. This is where um, you basically um, have a construction company or something. You send a load of workers over to complete a job and then bring them back. Links in with the idea that you sort of hear of Polish plumbers who sort of go over, get their paycheck and then return back to Poland controversial area within the context of EU law um, and in Laval this sort of came to a head. You notice the year of the case is 2007. This is not very long after a load of Eastern European countries joined the European Union and a Latvian company won a contract in Sweden and rather than abiding by Swedish trade union rules um, they basically sent over a load of Latvian workers who would do the work for cheaper and then would be able to return to Latvia afterwards um, with their money. Now, this was obviously very controversial. The Swedish workers went on strike against this, saying that they should be entitled to be able to do the work. Um, but the European Court of Justice said that the freedom of services has to be applied. And these Latvian workers do have the right to freedom of services and so they are able to travel to Sweden, do the work, and then return home. This was obviously sort of hugely controversial, arguably contributed to a lot of the sort of bad feeling in the EU at the time, especially around the time that they were trying to get an EU constitution together. And it has lingering effects, um, particularly in Sweden, which was one of the first countries to open its borders to these um, immigrants. And the other country at the time that also opened its borders to Eastern Europe was the UK. And you could argue that the Brexit vote was also associated with this opening up um, to these sort of cheaper Europe, Eastern European labour. The um, case in Laval obviously caused a lot of controversy. And so the Rome 1 regulations um, sort of helped this a little bit by making sure that um, existing employee rights are respected. But it'll be interesting to see how that fits in conjunction with the um, right to freedom of services, which obviously comes under the treaty. Finally, we can talk a little bit about the Bolkenstein Directive. Um, this is Directive 2006-123-EC. At the start, the Bolkenstein Directive was um, seeking to provide whole-scale change in this area of freedom of establishment and freedom of services across the whole of the European Union. 
by basically applying a country of origin approach. This would basically mean that me as someone who lives in the UK, if I went and set up a company in France or I provided a service in Germany, then I would still be governed by UK rules. This was particularly controversial because obviously those rules vary greatly from country to country. And so you would sort of, um, well, to put it another way, it was renamed the Frankenstein Directive at one point. And you can see why, because it creates a mishmash of um, domestic laws and the laws of other nation states. There was obviously a retreat from this country of origin approach after it received great criticism. And so the focus instead became on administrative and procedural simplification. So it's a useful directive now, but it was very much watered down from where it was originally intended to go. And that's all there is to it. If you're answering this as a problem question, then the first thing that you're going to be looking at in any question is whether the person is establishing something that is permanent when you're going to be looking at freedom of establishment or whether they're doing something more temporary where you're going to be looking at freedom of services. Once you've done that, you can sort of follow some of the case law in the slides that we've been looking at, thinking in particular about whether there are any hindrances or restrictions on that person's freedom and whether those hindrances or restrictions can actually be justified based on the treaty articles or the case law itself. If you're answering this as an essay question, then as I hinted at at the start, there's a lot of interesting stuff that you can really get into here. In the first place, you can talk about how the articles themselves have really helped to liberalise the European market. But don't be afraid to talk about some of the political, social and economic consequences of doing so. In particular, since the influx of cheaper labour from Eastern Europe and the effect that that has had on things like immigration and also wage prices, and also the availability within the internal job market of Western countries such as the UK, France and Germany. Well, I hope you enjoyed this lecture. If you did, make sure to leave it a like, subscribe for more videos in the future. And if you've got any questions, then leave those in the comments below. That's all from me and I'll speak to you again soon. Bye.